That's great. <laughs> That's a little, a little blanket. A little blanket for the object. <laughs> This object is so incredible. I guess I ha have um, a lot of thoughts about things in the museum, about bodies in the museum, um, about the history of, of the objects, um, the unnamed bodies in the museum, um, the history of expertise connected to the makers, and then how the makers are plugged into cosmologies or uh, knowledge traditions. Um, and I think that there's a diff like, I mean, I don't think it's a, um, we have established language around how knowledge works in institutions. And there's a history of like French thinkers, for example, which, I mean, it really, they just keep coming up in my head work a lot now, and I'm working with grad students now at uh, OCAD uh, University in Toronto, and, and how much French thinkers are like promoted, um, you know, and the French canon and these rational histories or humanist histories, German expressionist thinkers or all, the, all of those kind of things. Um, and you have this example of how how you're supposed to be in relationship to that kind of knowledge and how um, but I, I think that there is a there you know there is the lineage of knowledge that you're you're connected to as we know from people like Foucault or you know um, and then how you there is that like carrying on of that knowledge um, through your work and how well you're supposed to know the history of those thinkers and uh, in order to participate in the canon, right? Uh, that canon, you know, canon is such a weird word. Uh, um, but here it's very different. Uh, so the makers are, the line are that lineage, right? Uh, and there's a lot of mistakes that are made in making, actually. Uh, and you don't get a chance to see the mistakes in the museum. And that kind of is really interesting to me in, in relationship. Like, how does that history of mistakes uh, sit beside this sort of rationalist uh, French thinking? Uh, it, 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 and how those two things can walk together. Um, uh, that's the evidence of the body as well. And mistakes are the evidence of the body, you know? Um, and then when you hear or you like you go to different museums and you you hear the words or you see the words artist unknown right it really also uh, removes the possibility of uh, mistakes actually make a body um, human uh, uh, and so artist unknown really removes the possibility of of the human body making these things um, but I th I've been thinking about that a long, long time. And about how, uh, when indigenous bodies come into these environments, uh, how desperate we are to see something that of ourselves reflected back. Um, because the colonial manifest destiny is also uh, um, about amnesia. Uh, make, it's an amnesia-making machine. <laughs> um, 
And so you look deeply and you look hard to see um, something of yourself reflected by looking at the objects. And most of us don't know how to look at the objects um, because we're looking for the mistakes sometimes, most of the time, uh, often. And I've made a lot of mistakes in making. Like, and, and every time I come to these museums and I see the beautiful work that our Taltan ancestor artists make, I actually feel like a failure. I feel like I'm not good enough at all. And I'm pretty good. <laughs> but I look at these works and I think I just am not skilled enough at all to make these things. Um, so I feel like I, I should quit. Actually, it's funny, I, I've never said that out loud before, but, uh, or maybe I have. <laughs> um, and I know I'm not the only one who looks at these things, so there's a very interesting sort of co um, uh, complicated uh, love and admiration. One part of the complication, and then the second part of the complication is this uh, grief. And the third part of the complication is uh, negotiating and navigating a tra trauma or a PTSD response as a result of Canada's colonial interventions into the lives of Indigenous artists, as well as Indigenous families. Uh, and then, um, and I think that actually, this, uh, the fourth part of the complication, I think, is failure, fear of failure. Yeah, um, and I think that that fear of failure is actually something that comes from uh, a residential school, uh, intergenerational uh, survivor experience. It's the same uh, sort of fear of failure of speaking your language because you don't want to make the mistake, uh, which is sort of like a, a terrible leftover of getting hit because you're speaking your language. Yeah, you don't want to get hit, the physical impact of getting hit, you know? Um, all of that uh, while being in the museum. All of that while looking at objects that are made by ancestor artists. And all of that realizing that I am, uh, that when those ancestor artists make this, they're actually speaking to me. Yeah, they're making it for my body so that I can continue making it or I can continue using it in the ways that it was made or intended to be made, or sorry, intended to be used. Uh, it's a very, very complex thing. And so lately I've been really interested in the spider web as a way to navigate and um, navigate those intersections, and I'm using that word uh, in the feminist tradition, um, but also I think maybe I'm using that word intersection uh, as, as much as that word is useful there, I mean there's problems with all of the words, you know, so I'm trying it out, yeah, making a mistake maybe. Uh, but I think I'm using that, um, that intersection idea also as matriarchs uh, in the tradition of matriarchs would use that and understand that word, um, which also inform, informs ideas of continuum. So this object is, is saying something to me, and I as a performance artist who's thinking, who's thinking about my body and what my body is able to make, right? So that idea of failure is an interesting component piece to performance art. Uh, indigenous performance artists and the strategies of indigenous performance art are, are un I, I think, unique in, in the spectrum that is performance art. Um, so I can feel the hands that held this. All of them. I 
The other complication is actually holding history, holding indigenous art history. Um, and then some of my most expansive works as a performance artist or um, have been in relationship to museums. Uh, I spent a lot of time at Museum of Anthropology and I feel very blessed by that. Um, the uh, um, years ago they had a Taltan Nation uh, exhibition, so um, which was always very funny to me because I I didn't know that Moa was doing that, and at the same time I went to someone at the Vancouver Art Gallery saying I want to curate an exhibition of Taltan Nation artwork. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out that MOA and RBC and the Royal BC Museum in Victoria and the Museum of History had, were all sort of collaborating on an uh, exhibition of Taltan Nation artwork. Um, but only one uh, piece showed up, like one exhibition, one part of it. Uh, and when I went to the Vancouver Art Gallery, I was really nobody. So. You know, like, who cares, right? Um, and that was a whole other time. And I like telling this story because I never thought that I would be a performance artist. Like, and part of being a performance artist is your body's making meaning uh, in relationship to uh, environment, in relationship to other bodies in the room, in relationship to time. Um, I'm also very interested in the mitigation uh, and understanding of risk within performance art. Depending on the kind of performance art that you do or that you uh, make, um, that uh, mitigation of risk uh, can lead to a rupture. Uh, and that rupture actually uh, reframes uh, some uh, part of knowing or structures of power which uh, endeavor to control our way of knowing. Part of mitigation of risk also for me also means that uh, the colonial um, uh, situation in Canada, because uh, I, I, I li have lived within that with this body, um, like they don't want you to know how powerful your body is because your body is also a resource that is extracted uh, to serve uh, Canada and Canada's manifest destiny. And so that rupture that happens, yes, it, uh, it's a rupture so it causes pain, uh, but it also enables you to know how powerful your body is. And so this device um, very clearly lets you know how powerful your body is without rupture. And it's a performance of knowing, right? Um, and it, it's action, it's action also um, very clearly lets you know that what you're making is a contribution. So they had that exhibition here, uh, Medo Dihi, Our Great Answers Lived This Way. Uh, and um, Dita Cross, right? Uh, she was a education programmer, uh, asked me to present uh, my, th I misunderstood her actually. I thought she wanted me to talk about my work Right, and I was just this emerging artist and working at Redwire Native Youth Media Society here in Vancouver. Uh, and actually, Dita wanted me to come and talk about the exhibition. Yeah, so I spent all this time preparing and being super nervous and wrote this terrible speech that was really bad, you know, and um, I was really trying to experiment a lot with poetry or poetic sort of language and, um, and uh, I'm a sensitive person anyway, yeah. And so being around objects that have so much power is very hard for me after a time. Now that I'm a little bit older, I can mitigate that. 
Uh, but when I was younger and I was asked to do this talk, um, I was uh, not good at it. And so I spent way too much time in the museum and I just was like, f like filled up with too much, uh, I guess, spirit energy. And, uh, and so I ended up having a migraine. Yeah, and, uh, um, and then I had, for some reason, Tylenol Extra Strength, and I took three Tylenol Extra Strengths, which was a lot. Yeah, and so I was overwhelmed with energy. Um, what I thought I was going to talk about wasn't what was requested of me, so that, like, the last minute I had to kind of flip my head around a bit. Um, they had re reassured me, Dieter, Dieter Cross and Karen Bembeset, uh reassured me that no one was going to show up, so it'd be, you're going to be fine, they said. You're going to be fine, you know? Um, I had a whole bunch of slides of my previous work, too, so that was, like, behind me in the background, my slides. Um, and I just was so overwhelmed I couldn't talk, you know? Uh, and then uh, Charlotte Townsend Galt showed up with her. There was 12, like 10 people in the, you know, audience. And then Charlotte Townsend Galt showed up with her art history class. And then that meant that the right half of the theater uh, filled up. And then uh, Karen Dufick showed up with her art history class. And that meant the other half of the theater showed up. And I was not prepared for any of that stuff. Uh, and I was still stuck with this idea of... Um, speaking my reflection or sharing my reflections of the exhibition that happened here at the at MOA, right? Museum of Anthropology. And as I was saying earlier, like the uh, uh, complications, like I can talk about those complicated experiences inside of my body now, but 20, well, 15 years ago, I could not. Yeah. Uh, and so it was literally, okay, the, the second time I've spoken public. Uh, and it was like now when I work with students, like art students, I talk about my worst time, my worst experience speaking, and the, like all of the mistakes that I made, you know. Uh, I remember that it started with an agonizing, like an agonizing 15 minutes of silence because I was I couldn't even say the I couldn't even say hello yeah um, uh, Robert Davidson had a exhibition on at the time as well which was so incredibly moving to me uh, so I'm like to add the complications of like cry, like openly crying while I was looking at this artwork because I'd never imagined that a drawn line could be that. Like, it just, his line in the painting uh, was, it was like it was singing. It was like a loving act. It was so incredible, right? And, um, and I was asked to talk about the Taltan Nation collection. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember anything that I said, you know. Um, there was somebody in the audience who said something to me, asked a question, and uh, I can't remember who it was. I, you know, um, this uh, white woman, she was asking me, uh, she was asking me, I've lived here for a long time. My family's lived here for generations. I love being in the woods. Can I have uh, a deep relationship to the land like indigenous people do or can? And I said, no. <laughs> um, because I was so overwhelmed. Uh, and then people were, I think, surprised at what I said. And, you know, it's a funny response, right? But I wasn't trying to be um, rude to her. Because she asked me something that meant something. And everybody in the theater kind of laughed at my glib uh, response. Um, 
I feel bad about that. And I, um, I did go on further to kind of like, because the audience uh, said, um, the audience laughed, you know, and so I kind of like tried to pull apart my uh, answer uh, about the nature of relationships to land. Uh, and then um, Skeena Reese said something earlier that week to me about how people have been here for a long time, like you're not, it's not a, it's not a, you can't say to people, okay, you're, it's time for you to leave, you know. People have been here a long time, generations. People come here and fall in love or they need a place to stay or they need to be safe, you know. Like you can't say that. So I, that's what I, I re relayed those words to that question asker. Um, but it never felt like enough. It's never felt like enough. Um, I don't even know why I'm saying this right now, you know, like, um, I don't know who was, who that person is. I think what I would say to the, uh, what I would say now that I'm 41, you know, and, um, I think I would say yes. I think that's what I would say. Yes, you can. It's a very different answer. <laughs> um, exploitation is a whole other thing, though, right? Yeah. And if you're exploiting the land, that's a different thing. And I don't think people's relationships to place. Um, no, I'm going to say this. Uh, I think we need to rethink the language uh, of how we articulate our relationship to place. Because uh, there is such a danger of one story of relationship to land covering over another person's relationship to land. My work now uh, that I share, and I do a lot of collaborative work, um, and the work that I share now, specifically with Ayumi Goto uh, and Ashok Mathur, uh, re uh, actively um, attempts to decenter whiteness. And I think maybe the language of uh, whiteness um, enables one story to cover up other stories. And do I, do I think we need to... Um, I don't know, maybe uh, it's better to say it this way. Uh, Audre Lorde helps us still uh, and her um, speech uh, um, the 19, I think it was 1976, but the quote from the speech, uh, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. It's a very clear guideline, actually. But tool, like tools, right? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes tools are very clear and sometimes tools help us to enable help us to know the power of our bodies and to help it sometimes tools help us to know the power uh, of our bodies is a contribution um, sometimes tools help us to understand our relationship to a, to a, a cosmos um, and sometimes tools help us to um, understand that bodies are complicated. Uh, and I, I believe that there are so many systems which are older than this colonial system, which often sits at the center of how we're able to talk to each other and how we're able to understand our stories to the land. Um, 
that's why decentering whiteness, that the attempt to even decenter it, uh, helps us to see each other better, to see our bodies better. Um, and there are a lot of tools that we inherit. When I became a performance artist, uh, all Karen's fault. Yeah, yeah, Karen Bember said. If I didn't run into her at Rangoli and she said, well, I've been thinking about what you said at that first talk. That's right, because somebody said to me, would you ever show your work in a museum? And I said, well, no, I'm, I can't, I, no, because I don't know, I didn't at the time understand how to shift the politics. Yeah. So the answer, my answer was no. Yeah. And in my, the answer in my head was, uh, don't you have to be dead to show at a museum? Yeah. <laughs> that one, uh, even in my sort of like crazy ass state, I was glad that I didn't say that out loud. This is not true. <laughs> years and years later, I ran into people who were in the room during the talk. Yeah. And this one guy said to me, just we're at a baby shower, and he said, You look really familiar to me. I'm like, uh, Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then it, we s finally s settled on the talk or whatever, right? And um, he said, you were going through a lot of emotions that day. And I said, I, I wish I was. I was actually, I had taken too many aspirin or Tylenols. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little bit high. <laughs> Not on purpose sort of on purpose. <laughs> That's very funny and weird. <laughs> and I'll never forget that woman's question. Like, I'm just like, always, I've always felt bad about that. I never wanted people to laugh at that vulnerable moment. It was a vulnerable... Museum visitors, the museum and gift shop will be closing in 15 minutes at 5 p.m. Thank you for visiting the Museum of Anthropology. I got a shop. <laughs> no shopping for me. That's fine. <laughs> yes, it's true. I feel very spoiled holding this. I am. They did a. I I did some work with. Uh, um, objects from the Royal BC Museum just recently too, um, and uh, drums, hundred-year-old drums, um, and uh, I held them with my hands. And Brian, Brian's such a nice guy. Brian Seymour, do you know Brian? He's a very he's a collections manager. And uh, he said, you know, the usual thing, right? Um, well, there might be poison. Oh, well. And I'll never forget that. Uh, Joyce Johnson uh, telling me that I was al allowed to see the objects here, you know? Because I didn't know. And Joyce put me into contact with Alison Cronin. And Alison Cronin brought out all the things for me to look at. And she had a person there with her who said you had a you got to put the gloves on and Allison had left the room so this other person put the glove told me to put the gloves on and then Allison came back and said um, no she said no these are the things that belong to him he can touch them with his hands And because I was so um, young, I held these things and just cried and cried. I didn't expect that, you know? And I, I know that's not in, lots of folks to say that, 
um, it was a real gift to be able to hold those things. And I mean, as as you know from like that time on the on the land when Annie Hinu brought out the belt, the Taltan beaded belt, and put it in my hands, you know. And everything changed after that. That is how you're supposed to experience the work when you are a maker. Even if you're a bad maker like me. <laughs> yeah, uh, two days, we made eight videos of me holding the drums and dancing with the drums. In two days, I held over 800 years of indigenous art history. Yeah. yeah. And then those videos uh, get played by um, their graphic scores, and then they get played by musicians. Yeah, that's been my, my latest work, actually. Yeah, it was in Kingston at the Agnes Etherington in an exhibition called Soundings, um, curated by Dylan Robinson and Candace Hopkins. And so this violinist and this cellist, violinist was uh, Pamela Arduwalia, uh, and the cellist was um, from BC, living in New York, Dorothy Hoover, Hooper, um, and she played, she played the cello. Yeah. I'm going to be in the, that, the next show at the National Gallery, the, the big Indian show, indigenous show. Yeah. It's so cool. Like, I can't believe it. And when they called and I'm like, what? <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> we have a do. We have to do a site visit in June. I started doing this performance piece where I uh, become the collective breaths of every body that traveled all the pathways in Taltan Nation territory. And then I bring that breath into concert or connection with the artwork. And so I, they said, oh, we want you to do this. I'm like, okay, that's great. I'm, I can't wait. And then I said, then they told me how many artworks were in there. <laughs> he just said, you might have to, you might pass out. She was telling the um, conservation team, well, this is what he wants to do. He wants to breathe on all of the paintings, all of the things. Uh, and they were like, well, uh, no. <laughs> and I told, uh, I'm working with Rochelle Dickinson and uh, Greg Hill. And I told Rochelle, I said, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't say I was going to spit on the paintings. <laughs> and they're going to have a... Um, she said they're going to have a, um, they want to have a, like a, a trauma team follow me <laughs> just in case I pass out or hyperventilate. I'm like, how big is this fucking gallery, you know? <laughs> and they want, they want me to meet with the elder that advises them. So that'll be an interesting yeah, come to the show, come to the show, the two of you, the three of you, come to the show. It'll be in November. Yeah. I, um, but I won't be performing on opening night. <laughs> About my tattoos. So, uh, I'm Taltan from northern BC, a Crow clan person. My mom is Janelle Craig, and my father is Pierre Morin. Uh, Pierre Morin is from Tetford Mines in the middle of Quebec. Uh, they met and fell in love uh, 
probably eventually. <laughs> and now they have this um, uh, beautiful love. Maybe it's always been beautiful. Anyway, we moved here when I moved from north to Surrey, BC when I turned 16. Uh, didn't really understand what the colonial uh, amnesia thing was. Everybody was talking about identity at the time. I found this book uh, called The Taltan Indians by George Emmons when I was 18. Uh, and so what I wanted to do, uh, in, in the book he has uh, uh, drawings of Taltan artworks. Um, and so when I, when I turned 21, I think 21, I decided I wanted to get one of those uh, George Emmons drawings of a Taltan Nation artwork tattooed on my body. Yeah, so that's this here in the back here. I think you can see it there, the two bands here. And uh, those um, actually are the uh, uh, anthropologists uh, often refer to it as a burden strap. And so the strap goes for you when you're carrying a moose, right? Heavy thing. It goes over here and goes under here and supports the pack. These were the bones that were in the sewn into the strap. Uh, so the strap didn't bunch up, right? Um, what I was always found really important about that was that the bones that Emmons found and wrote about in his book, they were often sewn in, so nobody actually saw that they had these markations on them until they were removed from the strap. Right? I, always, I always find that fascinating. And uh, I was just this young kid, and I come from a place where people work really hard. Elders I grew up with worked really hard. So I wanted to have these tattoos to remind uh, to remind myself that I have to work hard like my uh, elders did. Good afternoon, museum visitors. The museum and the gift shop are now closed. Thank you for visiting the Museum of Anthropology. Uh, the second tattoo is this one. And this is a stick and poke tattoo that was done by Gabe Hill. Um, it's a Cree Métis artist uh, located here in Vancouver. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, his name was David Melville, as uh, a Caribbean Canadian guy. Uh, he was my elder for a long time, and my brother, and my friend. And he died. He passed away. Uh, when he, after he died, um, lots was going on in my life. But this little hummingbird was following me around. And David had um, a, a, um, a, a thing called peripheral neuropathy, which meant uh, a deadening of his nerves. So this really tall, beautiful uh, guy who couldn't move. And, uh, and I thought, okay, so if you couldn't move in one reality, you are going to become a hummingbird in the next reality. Yeah, and so this is here uh, to remind me of the love he shared with me, and it's to remind me of the love that I have for him. Um, this one says, I am a musical instrument for Mother Earth. This is, um, uh, in 2009, I curated an exhibition which took place in two parts. Uh, one part was called uh, Speaking in Landscape Tongues, and the other part was called Speaking to the Old Ones. Uh, in Speaking in Landscape Tongues, Cheryl LaRondell, Cree Métis performance artist, singer-songwriter, uh, thinker, um, she was one of the first uh, indigenous folks to consider um, the internet as a, an indigenous space. Uh, she did this performance for me, uh, for my curatorial project, uh, in which she was saying this phrase over and over again in Cree, right? And eventually I asked her and I said, um, what were you saying? I love it so much. I love what you're saying. Uh, so she said it in Cree. And I'm not going to try and say what she was saying in Cree because I can't remember. 
And she used the English to communicate what she was saying. And she said over and over again, I am a musical instrument for Mother Earth. So this is Cheryl LaRondell's artwork um, here. Uh, that takes me to here. This is, uh, this is, um, there was a, uh, uh, Entlekatmuk uh, artist named Dion Kazix who's been uh, contributing to the indigenous tattoo revitalization uh, in Canada. Because one of the things that happened under the potlatch ban, uh, which was a um, part of uh, a group of legislation called the Indian Act, it outlawed tattoos. Uh, so this is a, a, what you call, what he calls a earth line. Uh, and it's a skin stitch. So he, you know, had a thread and a needle and he stitched this into me. This is also, um, and so the earth line, as he explained it, uh, so Intlikutmuk uh, clothing uh, often had a line painted around. Uh, and on the clothing, the line is supposed to represent, uh, or remind, sorry, remind, uh, the wearer about their connection to the earth. And then he added this uh, stick and poke sun. So this is really interesting, right? Because this is like uh, prison tattoo style with a sewing needle, stick and poke. And this is um, remembering indigenous stick and poke uh, tattooing. Uh, that moves me to this, uh, the, this mark is given to me by Dion Kazix again. Uh, and the four lines, four stitch lines uh, in Intlikatmuk um, culture are supposed to represent courage and bravery. And he said to me, I want to give you this mark um, because I've witnessed the work you've done as a performance artist. And I want to honor you for uh, what you give to us. And I want to offer this remembrance of courage because you need to be brave in your work. That leads me to this. So there's a Mi'kmaq artist. His name is Jordan Bennett. He apprenticed uh, at the Earthline Tattoo School with Dion Kazix. Um, my work now thinks a lot about memory and what memory does. And I want my work to also remember the indigenous artists who passed away. Because I think, uh, because I'm a part of that art history, uh, I'm responsible for remembering them. Uh, one of the first artists I ever met, um, you know, I didn't meet her, but I saw her work, uh, was Shahana Didith. She's often labeled as the last of the Beothic people. Uh, but for me, she uh, drew. She was a drawer and an artist. And so I, I, uh, I told um, Jordan that I wanted a mark to remember uh, and to acknowledge how Shahana Didith was one of the first indigenous artists to inspire me. And so what you have here is a stick and poke Beothic canoe uh, with a skin stitch line here and a north star. And the reflection of the Beothic canoe is Shahana Didith's uh, drawing of the moon. And that leads me to, oh, here. Uh, is there something there? <laughs> uh, there are two uh, very important women in my life. Their names are uh, Karina and Desiree Sparrow. Uh, Karina is um, Musqueam, from Musqueam and Pentlatch, uh, and Desiree is Gitsan. And uh, they said we want to have the same mark as our little crow brother. So we all have a crow. There's a crow there, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we all have a crow mark, uh, a flying crow. Uh, but I, that wasn't enough for me. So I was like, because I love them so much. Uh, so I got a sparrow. Uh, that's a sparrow for my sparrows. 
Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there was this kid I used to work with um, named Naomi Kennedy, and I, I realized that she, well, she told me she makes extra cash by giving tattoos out uh, in her house, and I just wanted to like hang out with her uh, and give her some money because I had extra money. So she, Naomi, did this for me, and she did this for me. Uh, and I, um, a long time ago, had a dream about a crow with a human heart. Uh, it's probably my regalia, but I haven't made it yet. Maybe someone will make it for me. Oh wait, somebody did. <laughs> uh, Yolanda Skelton, who's good Sam, she's connected, she's cousins with Desiree, Desiree Sparrow, uh, made me a vest, a Northwest Coast vest. So the crow is on the back and it has a, it has a Northwest Coast human heart there. So the tattoo came first and the vest came second. Um, which leads me to this. There's something there, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Tanya Willard, Gabe Hill, and I are part of a collective called Bush Gallery. And there's, well, there, that's a fluid collective. There's lots of uh, amazing, powerful people there. And Janine Freeman Jutley is one of those amazing, powerful people in the Bush Gallery collective. Uh, and so we did this, uh, we um, put up a Bush Gallery. Bush Gallery made a Bush Gallery. Uh, which means we put up a teepee. Uh, and in, inside that teepee, we had um, Dion Kazix come and do a tattoo action uh, for us. And so it's a skin stitch circle. Uh, oh no, it's a, it's a stick and poke circle uh, and a skin stitched hashtag. Uh, because at the time when Tanya uh, and Gabe and I, the first time we did Bush Gallery, None of us knew what a hashtag was. <laughs> so it, me it seemed to make sense to use landmarking tape and put, you know, hashtag Bush Gallery on the land. So we did that, uh, and now we have these. Um, yes, which leads me to this. 20 years later, that's always 20 years later because I can't remember dates or whatever. Um, I've returned to that book that George Emmons book. And so this is a, this is actually a, um, in the language you call it togadi, and it's used to, like, to remove the flesh from uh, moose hide in order to turn it into um, smoke tan hide, right? You have to pull the flesh off and the, the um, fascia has to be removed. And there's this beautiful mark here, this beautiful drawing on the bone and I wanted to put that here um, because this is a, this is my ancestors paintbrush the tools of art making right um, so it moved from being back where I can't see it to where I see it every day yeah which leads me to this uh, in my effort to uh, show my allegiances to artists and to remember uh, the artists that have significantly changed my life. Um, my grandma, her name is Dinah, her English name is Dinah. Um, she had three names in our language. Uh, my favorite one to say is Hokak um, Ichman. In a, the English language to communicate meaning uh, is when the river is at its highest and throws sand on the banks. This is her artwork. Uh, and this is currently on the pair of moccasins that my mom wears every day. Uh, and this tattooing was done by a young, cream, uh, young Métis woman named Adi Murray, who also apprenticed at the Earthline Tattoo School. Uh, and that leads me to here. Um, so in honoring uh, and sharing my allegiances to artists, indigenous artists, there's this incredible artist, uh, Wulustuk uh, or Maliseet, artist named Shirley Bear, 
uh, who was my mentor and my elder and my friend. And she used to sign her artwork with this mark. Um, and I think it's usually referred to as Abenaki woman. Um, but it, for me, it's Shirley Bear. Yeah. And then um, when I recently was doing a performance with um, Jeremy Dutcher, who is uh, also a Willistook, and um, Bracken Hannes Corlett, who is um, a Wicano in uh, Kwakwakewak. Huh. Oh, that's bad. I can't remember right now. Uh, we, um, we got matching because we'd all been inspired by Shirley Bear. And the performance was called Ancestor Song Research Laboratory. And the last Ancestor Song was to turn off all of the equipment and for us to go to the microphone and talk about why Shirley Bear uh, inspired us or saved us or helped us to become artists. I guess the last thing, I, the last thing, is it the last thing? I don't know. Um, I guess the, uh, and my mom, her name is Janelle. Her English name is Janelle. Uh, her, the Denek Eh Anya Adzutsa, that's her name, Adzutsa. Um, and she got that name from an elder lady uh, named Emma Brown. Uh, Emma Brown was 107 years old when she died. Um, my mom has Alzheimer's, so I've been thinking a lot about memory and what memory does. Yeah, and I refuse to see my mom in any deficient way. Yeah, so uh, she's not falling behind, she is going ahead. Um, and at the base of what I'm learning now from her, uh, what she's helping me to understand is that love helps you to remember. Love does. Uh, our family has a genetic marker, uh, which leads to um, uh, Alzheimer's, a familial Alzheimer's. So this... Uh, uh, there's only three uh, families in Canada that have this genetic marker, and our family is one of them. And so, um, thinking about uh, um, what the body is able to do, but also what the body is able to perform, but also how the body performs memory, how my mom fought so hard to be a matriarch so that uh, she can... Uh, be that role um, and how uh, this is also me abstractly thinking about decentering whiteness uh, in our experience so that we can see each other better uh, how uh, there's a colonial memory which gets prioritized and so um, that means if you can't remember the dates then you're not an active participant in the colonial structures of power. You don't get to activate them. Um, uh, the objects also, these objects, um, they don't uh, solely activate colonial structures of power. They have a memory too, right? So as my mom is a time traveler, and as I want to understand my mom's experience more in my performance practice, I've become a, a time traveler. These objects themselves are time travelers. And they speak to a continuum. Uh, that continuum is like the spider web that I was talking about earlier, right? So it's all actually mapped out uh, within this cosmos. And when I pick up this object that is made by an ancestor artist for me, uh, I am also an ancestor artist for someone else down the line. This moment, these words maybe mean something for that uh, future ancestor artist. 
Um, and maybe they mean nothing. And when I hold this, I can feel, I can actually feel all of the bodies that have held this. That is a lot. <laughs> 